All right, let's take our Bibles, please, and open to the book of Psalms, chapter 39. Psalms 39. And you'll read the first seven verses here. And this will be the, the first. I don't know if we'll be doing how many of these messages in a row there will be, but uh, I am working on one or two others, and they'll likely be. Well, I don't know if they'll be Sunday evening or Sunday morning sermons, to be honest with you. But uh, Psalms 39, uh, the first seven verses, the, we're going to be studying a little bit about the what the Bible says about our thought life, uh, the things that we think about. Psalms 39, let's read these responsibly. I'll begin in verse 1. Please join in reading out loud the even-numbered verses following along, and I'll finish on verse 7. I said... I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle, while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence, I held my peace, even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me, while I was musing the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know my end, and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity, Selah. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches, and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. And that's prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this evening. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, speaking to us through it. We ask that you do so again tonight. With those that uh, uh, watch this online as well as our other sermons and Bible studies, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will speak to them, help them, encourage them, and strengthen them. Uh, if any comes to these messages not knowing Christ as their Savior, God, I pray your Holy Spirit will speak to them about their need uh, for salvation. They would seek you out repent and turn to Jesus and be saved. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, as I said, we're going to talk about the thought life. I looked up the word muse in the Bible, and it's only found in three places, and this is one of those places. The word muse means to ponder, to think closely, to study in silence, uh, it's a little bit different than meditating, <clears throat> but they, they do have some similarities in, in process. We'll look at uh, the meditation at, in another study and, and just uh, thinking uh, in general in, in another one as well. Uh, but the word muse means to be so occupied in study or contemplation as not to observe passing scenes or things present. In other words, you're so caught up in focusing on, on thinking about something, on studying something out in your mind that the things around you kind of pass by uh, without your being aware of them. Uh, for example, he says here um, in uh, verse 3, My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. And so he's, he's very deep in thought. He's studying and thinking over some things in his mind. And while that's happening, he doesn't even realize that the fire is burning. And, you know, things are happening that he's not aware of because of his being deep in thought. And what is the context here? Well, part of it is he's, he's working on, he says in verse 5, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. And so his goal here, he has a, a specific and a particular goal. I want to be very careful and not sin with the things that I say. And boy, there's a lot of things we can say wrong. We, there's a lot of things we can say that are hurtful and, and not helpful. And, and <clears throat> there's things we can flat out, we can do evil with our mouths. It's a, the, the tongue is a very mighty thing. And it's, there's a potential for great good. And there's a, pro, a potential for great damage as well for blessing and cursing. And so he's, he's decided and he's purposed, I, I want to do what I can 
to not sin. So here's an attempt, a very specific attempt to not sin. And it, it's interesting to, uh, to think about this and to look at it because he says, in doing that, that uh, now the, the musing is, is connected with that. There's a, there's a correlation here. And he says, well, I, uh, and so what I did was I just kept my mouth shut. I didn't talk at all. Uh, and he says, I didn't talk evil, but I also didn't talk good. And he said, then my heart was, was hot within me. And, and, and so I, I began, I was musing on these things. And, and what that did was then it led him to, to begin speaking again. And what he did then in his speaking is he turns to God and begins speaking to him. And what a good, what a good uh, procedure here. He says, I don't want to sin with my mouth. I don't want to sin in the things that, I, that I'm saying. And so I'll just keep my mouth shut. And, and he's thinking and going over this and going over it and going over it in his mind. And then he, he turns to God and says, I think I'll, I'll talk to you. And he says, Lord, make me to know my end. In verse 4, and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. So in all this, he, he begins in asking God, God and, and it's, he asks God, God, tell me about me. And what, what a great place to go to find out about ourselves. And, and see, in, in, his, in his stopping and thinking, he, he comes to the realization, I've been thinking some wrong things. I've got some wrong ideas about some things. And I'm going to go to God and get my ideas from Him. I'll tell you what, I think there's a lot of damage uh, done in the world of people to themselves. And certainly there's a lot of damage that people do to other people. But, but I think there's, there's people that are, uh, they're very careful to not damage other people. They're very careful. I don't want to say anything that's hurtful to anybody else. I don't want to say anything that's going to uh, detract from their going forward and, and progressing in life. I don't want to cut anybody down. I don't want to uh, give bad reports about anybody. I don't want to be involved in gossiping. There's people that work very hard about that. And then they turn around and they think and in their own minds say things that are hurtful about themselves. And, and they, they tear themselves down, they beat themselves up, they, they make a mistake, and boy, they just go on, and, and they live on that, and live on it, and live on it, and keep that going, and keep that going. And I tell you, it, as destructive as it is for you to go around and, and to say bad things about somebody else all the time, it's also destructive for you to be going over that in your own mind. You'd be better off to just sit down and be quiet for a while, spend some time thinking, and then turn to God and say, God... You tell me about me. You tell me about me. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth. He said, well, my, my days, they're, they're, they're not very long at all. And mine age as nothing before thee. And so he begins to think, he says, you know what? Compared to God, my timeline is insignificant. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Then we see that word sila. For a long time, scholars didn't know what that meant. Remember, the, the word, the, the psalms are songs. They were the hymnal that God gave to us. And that word sila is a musical term. It's a, it's a rest, uh, is what you would call it musically, or a pause, if you will. And so the first five verses are sung, and then there's a pause in there. So he says, stop right here. And, and we're just pausing right here on, on, this, on this concept or on this thought, if you will. And then in verse 6, he picks up again. It says, surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. You know, you heap up a bunch of riches and you have no idea who that money's going to go to. And, and he says, and now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. And so after all this thinking... After all this, this change in his realization of how great God is in comparison to himself, he says, I'm not going to put my hope in riches. I'm not going to put my hope in the things of this world. He said, all that, is, the word vanity means emptiness. It's hollow. It has no value. It has no strength. It has, it has nothing in and of itself. 
I'm going to put my hope in God. And how does he arrive at that? He arrives at it by spending some time in a, in a purposeful, concerted, and, and deep thought. The Bible says that the, uh, Jesus is going to come back in a time when people think not. And I used to think that that meant he was going to come back in a time that people didn't think he was going to come back. But that's not what it says. It says that he's going to come back at, in such an hour as, as you think not. When people aren't thinking. And, and I want you to consider for a moment, how many people do you know that are that you would look at them and say, there is a thinker. There's somebody who, who ponders and thinks things out and, and uh, uh, just digs into things. And, and that person is a thinker. And, and I don't know of a whole lot of people that, that are known by that reputation. We might look at somebody and say, there's a good eater and they're married to a good cook and we might look at somebody else and say well there's somebody who's good at, at at humor they have a good sense of humor they're good at making other people laugh and, and and i'm not saying that any of these things are necessarily sinful but i'm saying when's the last time you really looked at somebody and said that's a thinker they have they have really thought things out very well and and i i knew such a man he's he's since passed away i think my dad was one of those men as well uh, who, who sat and, and considered and pondered and, and thought things out. There's, but the number of those people are becoming very uh, few and far between. I uh, spoke to my good friend, uh, Brother Manning, today. He called and, and he said, I had something, uh, I had a couple things happen that, that I'd never had happen before. And he's been in the ministry a couple years longer than I have as far as pastoring. And um, he had uh, two brothers uh, that got saved recently and uh, they wanted to get baptized this morning. And their father came to church with them uh, for their baptism. Their father trusted Christ as his Savior in church this morning. Praise the Lord for that. And that's happened before. He said, but he said uh, he was he was in the back getting ready and, and preparing for the baptism. He was going over things for them and, and telling them, you know, here's how I want you to hold on and, and uh, here's what we're going to be going through and everything. And one of the young men said to him, you know, I've been reading... In, in John chapter 1 and John chapter 2 and, and uh, about this and about this and about this, about baptism. And he said, I just wanted to study up in the Bible on what it was all about before I got baptized. And, and he's, I think, a 10 or 11 year old boy. And he's, Brother Manning said, that's never happened to me before in the ministry where somebody stopped and they studied and they spent time thinking about this and studying about, and he said, is this what it is? And he, he just went over some things that he had found in his own study of the Bible. And Brother Manning said, you're exactly right. That's exactly what baptism is all about. And, and then they had to determine who was going to go first. And they were both excited about being baptized. And they said, I want to go first. And, and each one had his hand up, I want to go first. And Brother Manning was about to ask them who was going to be more spiritual and, or more Christ-like and allow the other one to go first. When all of a sudden they just instantly broke out into paper, scissors, rock to determine who was going to go first. He said, I've never had that happen before either. Uh, but uh, uh, after the services, he, he went up to uh, their dad to talk to him. And his dad had his back turned to him. And as he approached, he turned around and looked at him. And he said, I just accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. And, and just, just uh, without being prompted or asked or anything like that, he, he gave a testimony of salvation. Praise the Lord for that. But listen, praise the Lord for a young man who at a very early age he is already applying himself to thought when so many and there is so much in our culture and in the world today dedicated to eliminate the thinking process. Don't think. We'll just we'll tell you what to think. Just read this, memorize it, uh, be able to, to answer for the test. And the test is going to be multiple guess and, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd like to find out uh, how many high schoolers have essays on their exams anymore. Something that requires them to prepare and put some thought into the answer that they are giving. And something that requires the teacher to put some thought into evaluating their answer rather than just going down and saying, okay, I have the answer key right here. I just have to match the letters and the numbers and, and then we're done and, and we're gone for the summer. Uh, but uh, there's a whole lot of teachers that don't want to be required to think anymore. And so their students 
How can they require and expect their students to put any thought into anything when they themselves are just going through the motions? And here is a man, David, who said, I want to be careful. I don't want to sin. I want to be kept from that. I'm going to spend some time musing. I'm going to spend some time that in, in thinking in such a way that I'm so occupied in my study, in my contemplation of this, that the things that are going on around me, I'm not going to be aware of them. I'm going to ponder and to think closely. I'm going to study it in silence. Boy, don't we live in a noisy world. There's all manner of, of sources of noise around us. How many times do, do our phones give us notifications of, of, of truly worthless things? And I understand there's communication from, from people we know and loved ones. And, th and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about... Uh, you put an app on for any business now, and then it says, oh, hey, 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 by the way, if you wanted a taco today, we'll help you. Here's a coupon for a taco. If you want a burger, uh, why don't you come on in and buy the burger, and we'll give you a free uh, small order of french fries with that for your, for your and, and you, you get these notifications, and it, it sounds a bell, it sounds a chime or something like that, and noise and noise and one noise after another, and and just noise cluttering our mind and musing means to ponder or to think closely or to study in silence and whether it's an actual elimination of noise and sound from around us or that we are so occupied in that study we're so occupied in that contemplation and in that thought process that the things around us are just shut out the next place where the word muse is found is a few chapters later in Psalms 143. Three different places in the Bible where this particular word is found. By the way, when you put the letter A in front of a word, then that turns it into the opposite. The, the prefix A means not or non. So amuse, we say, oh, that's amusing. What that literally means is that is something that is causing me to not think. So Jesus coming back in such a day as when men think not. Mm. Well, we have entire parks, hundreds of acres, some of them dedicated to not think. Uh, TV shows submitted for your amusement. Just turn off the thinking. You know, I, I don't know if teachers even tell the kids, put on your thinking caps anymore. Just put on your listening caps. Listen, let me force feed this to you. Let's get this day over with and let's all go our separate ways. Uh, number two, Psalm 143. Uh, we'll start verse one. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant. For in thy sight shall no man live, living be justified. Look at verse three. It says, for the enemy hath persecuted my soul. And so David is coming before God. He's asking for a hearing. He's saying, God, I need you to hear my supplication, my begging, what I'm about to say. And he says, I'm in a situation for the enemy hath persecuted my soul. He hath smitten my life down to the ground. He hath made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. Boy, what a, what a sad situation. What a dark time the psalmist is in here. And he says, literally, my, my enemy has attacked me. There are people that are, that are trying to destroy me. They're persecuting me. Now, now here's, the, here's the man who's after God's own heart. Here is David, the leader of his mighty men. Here's David, who as a teenage boy uh, slew the mighty man of war, Goliath, and he had, he had uh, extra stones in his bag for the rest of Goliath's brothers. And later on in life, as an old man, he went after one of Goliath's brothers and still beat him. His men said, you know what, that one almost got David. Uh, how about we take over going to war from now on? But uh, here's David, he's a mighty man, and he's, he's, he's being overwhelmed in his spirit. Now, physically, David's enemies never whooped him. 
I mean, he came out and, and, and he went into battle with, with God on his side and he, he had victory after victory after victory after victory. No matter what the odds were, God, uh, David was a, a mighty man of war uh, with God at his side and, and helping him out and giving him the strength and the guidance and the wisdom and the talent and the skill necessary for the things that needed to be done. But he's saying, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. Hey, you know, there's a, there's a time that we should spend musing. And one of those times is when we want to focus. You know, if, if you want to live a life with less sin, you want to work on not sinning as much, that's going to take some thought. Now, if you want to be good at something, it's going to take some application, some study on that thing. And the Bible says study to show thyself approved unto God. And and so it's a that study, that's musing Studying is part of musing. But that's not the only time to muse. Look at verse 4. It says, uh, Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. And there's that word again, Selah. So just pause right here. From time to time, I believe everybody gets overwhelmed. And it might be a concerted attack by a person. It might be that a person truly has it in for you or they've got it out for you they they have focused they've pointed their arrows at you and they're launching them it's like why don't they just leave me alone there are times when circumstances of life come and overwhelm us things that over which we have no control now there's times where somebody is directly controlling uh, an attack against us and sometimes it's just Things that are happening. You know, it could be, it just could be one thing after another that, that happens. It could be the, the company decides to downsize. It's not that the president of the, of the company says, I, I want that person fired. I want them out of here. They just, they have to lay off some people. Uh, it, it can be an unexpected bill. It can be something comes up and somebody has to go to the hospital, has to go to the doctor and, and the doctor orders tests and the, the expenses start to rack up. And, and that, you know, financial situations can be overwhelming. Emotional situations can be overwhelming. It, it can be uh, the death of a loved one. And, and uh, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, well, I guess it's been a few years ago now. I, I preached a funeral for a young man. And uh, after that funeral, that young man's older brother went out with some of his friends. And, and uh, on the way back from spending time with his friends, he was on his motorcycle and he... He was in a horrible motorcycle accident and he died on the very day that we buried his, his little brother. And, and uh, uh, boy, what an overwhelming circumstance to, to his poor mother, uh, who's now left childless, uh, buries one son in one day and just a few hours later gets the news of the other son uh, leaving this world. And, and things like that can be a very overwhelming thing. What to do in those situations? And God said, here's a perfect time for us to spend some time musing. So my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. So he goes back in his mind to the days of old. And he begins meditating on God's works in verse 5. And he says, and I muse, I muse on the work of thy hands. Instead of spending time thinking about what his own hands can do, what he can do to get out of this situation, to get out of this, this overwhelming circumstances, the being overwhelmed by the enemy. And I tell you, if, if you allow it to happen, that enemy will become bigger and bigger in your sight. And David said, I'm not going to do that. He said, I'm already, I'm already in a situation where I'm overwhelmed. I don't like that. I don't, I don't like living in, in, that's not the neighborhood I want to live in. That's not the house I want to live in. And David said, I, I'm going to change the way I'm thinking. 
you know what, the, the being overwhelmed has a lot to do with what's going on in here, what's going on in the heart, deep down in our thoughts. And he said, I, I'm going to change what I'm thinking. I'm going to change what I'm meditating on. I'm going to change what I'm musing about. In those situations, I'm going to muse about what God did with his hands. You know, if somebody's attacking you, wouldn't it be good for you to think about how big God's hand is? And a lot of us think, Here's, let's see, how am I going to avoid their attack? How am I going to counter? How am I going to maneuver? How, how, you know, if they punch with the right and I block with my left and then I counter with my right, or am I going to counter with a kick? Am I going to take a sword to this? Am I going to take a knife to this? Am I going to take a gun? Uh, maybe a cannon, a howitzer cannon might be good in one of these. And instead of thinking and planning and doing all those things, David said, I'm going to think about how big God's hand is. And I'm not going to worry about them anymore. I'm not going to let the enemy overwhelm me. And the best thing you can do is to not raise your hand and retaliate against your enemy. I tell you, God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. When you begin to retaliate and begin to formulate in your mind a plan to get back at that person and I'm going to utterly destroy them and, and this will do them in once and for all, then that makes two people God has to deal with. And, and I'd rather him just spend his energy on one. Not that it's going to tax him any, but I'd rather not have that type of focus put on me. And so somebody decides to attack and the best thing you can say, you know what? I'm not going to think about that. God will deal with them. God will take care of them. And just as that little boy that went to the store and he was real good with his mom in the store, and at the end the, the storekeeper said, uh, hey, reach into that jar of candy and grab you out a handful, and that little boy just kept his hands to his side and kind of kept his head bowed down a little bit, and his mom said, go ahead, son. He was right. You were very good, and, and uh, uh, that's fine. Go ahead and get your handful of candy. And he still just kept his hands down. The man reached his own hand in, and grabbed a handful of candy and said, here you go, son, take that with you. And the boy had to put both of his hands out to be able to contain what that meant. And they got outside and the mom said, why didn't you reach in there? And he said, mama, he's got bigger hands than I have. And it's good and it's time for Christians to realize God has bigger hands than you do. And so if somebody needs smacked, let him do the smacking. He's got the bigger hand. If somebody needs dealt with, you need to spend some time musing on the work of his hands. And he says, I stretch forth my hands under these. He says, I'm, I'm just going to show you. I'm not raising and lifting my hands against that person. I'm raising them to you. And they're yours. I'm not going to do anything. My, my middle sister used to say, yep, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And then she'd say, Lord, use me. Uh, and that's not, and she was, of course, kidding. That was tongue in cheek. But, you know, there's a lot of Christians think that way. I want to be used of God when it comes to retaliation against my enemy. And uh, just leave that in his hands. But sometimes it's not a personal enemy that has overwhelmed you. Sometimes it's just circumstances. It doesn't matter. You end up in a situation where your spirit is overwhelmed. That would be a good time to spend some time musing on the works of God's hand. There's one other place where, the first, where that verse is found, and it's in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. <clears throat> John the Baptist has begun his ministry. He's going about preaching uh, repentance. And this has created quite a stir and people of different professions and different uh, places in life have come to him and said, what should I do? And he's telling them what they should do. And then we pick up in verse 15. And as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. So here men have gathered around, they've listened to John the Baptist, not John the Presbyterian or Episcopalian or even John the Catholic but he's, John, they've been listening to John the Baptist preaching he's preaching the, the coming of the Messiah, he's preaching unto them repentance he's preaching in a very powerful and, and direct way and they begin wondering is 
this the Messiah? Is this the promised one? Is this the Christ, the anointed one that we've been waiting for, the Savior of our people? And, and they're musing on this. And verse 16, John answered, saying unto them, All, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, here's the third situation for musing. Not, uh, first of all, when we're working on living a more righteous and more uh, sanctified life, and attempting to avoid sin. Second of all, when we get into a situation where we're overwhelmed in life. And third of all, in a situation where we need discernment. Here they're trying to discern. They, they, they're trying to, uh, a, a spiritual matter, discern a spiritual matter. Is this the Christ? Or not? Is he just a preacher? Or is he the son of God? Is he the Messiah that we're looking for? Or is he somebody else? And sometimes you're, you're going uh, to hear something from somebody. And in your mind, in your heart, you're going to wonder, is that true what they're saying or not? And, and I encourage you, don't ever take any preaching just at face value. I, Get into the Bible. Spend some time musing on those things. Spend some time in the Bible where you are so occupied in study and contemplation that time gets away from you. That your environment goes on without you. That you have thought closely on it. You've studied it in silence. And whether there's silence or not around you, in your mind, there's silence around you because... Your mind is consumed with what you're thinking about. The Bible talks about the Christians in Berea who are more noble. What was it that made them more noble? They went and they heard the preaching and then they searched the scriptures daily to verify the preaching. I'm not saying you should always have the pastor on trial every single last little thing, but I am saying <clears throat> there's some things in the Bible you're going to hear a preacher you're going to hear a statement you're going to hear somebody who claims to be a Christian and, and they're, somehow they're going to wind up in your life you're going to wind up with an earshot of them and they're going to say something that maybe you've never heard before you're going to say I wonder if that's true or not I wonder if that's true or not I mean it's a big deal and then you hear me preach on things that are that are big things. And you need to settle it in your mind and in your heart for you, the truth of it. Now I'm going to tell you, Jesus is the Son of God, but don't just take my word for it. Get into the Bible and be convinced scripturally why Jesus is the Son of God. See, if somebody comes to you and they say, is Jesus the Son of God? And you say, well, yeah, of course he is. And they say, why? Are you able to give an answer? If they say, are you going to heaven? Yes, of course I'm going to heaven. Why? Are you able to give an answer of the hope that is in you? Because the Bible commands us to be ready to give an answer of the hope that's within us. The hope of, of Jesus, that blessed hope that Jesus is coming back. It's an assured hope. It's a guaranteed hope, not one of these, uh, uh, well, I, I hope that comes out. I hope we don't go into a recession. Well, guess what? We're there. You can quit hoping that that, that doesn't happen because we're, we're already 18 steps into it. And if you can't give it, if you say, well, that's what I believe because that's what my preacher said. You need to do some time musing. You need to spend some time in a close study, in, in a, a deep pondering and going through. You know, one of, there, there's two, if you want to study the Bible, there's three things you need. First of all, you need a King James Bible. You need a good dictionary of the English language. Webster's, they got a real old Webster's dictionary. That's a very good one to have. 
And a concordance is a good book to have. It doesn't have to have the definitions in Greek and the definitions in Hebrew. It doesn't have to have all that. Those things are kind of nice to have from time to time. I look up the word think and there's several different words in, in the word in the Hebrew, or I'm sorry, in the Greek language for the word think. I thought, wow. Well, that's interesting. We have the word think. <laughs> and and what does that mean? Well, you can look it up in the dictionary. I looked up the word muse in the dictionary and copied that out right here. Um, but if you have those three books, you can look up a word in that concordance and find every place, every instance in the Bible where that word is found. So you can look up the word think and find it all the times where in the book of Genesis that word is found and all the times, all throughout all the books of the Bible. And you can start reading and studying those verses and the context of those verses. You can look up uh, a word close to it. You can look up the word think itself in the dictionary and say, okay, now I know what it means in the English language. Now I'm going to see how it's used in the context of it and, and study this out. I looked up the word muse in the Bible. That's how I know there's three places where it's found. Two in the book of Psalms, one in the book of Luke. One time it was when David was saying, I, I want to be careful to not sin. Uh, that's what I'm working on. And maybe he, he realized I have a problem. I sin with my mouth. I want to work on that. And so he spent some time musing. There was another time where he, he found himself, his spirit was overwhelmed. I'm going to spend some time musing. And here, the men listening to the preaching were in need of some spiritual discernment. And what did they do? They spent some time musing. Now, one thing that helped with their spiritual discernment was the answer that John gave. Basically, and I'm just going to paraphrase and shorten it here, he said, I'm not him. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. I'm not him. I'm not him. Now, the reason you would untie somebody's shoes would be in preparation to wash their feet. He said, I'm not even worthy to begin in that direction. Beware of preachers who not only build themselves up but allow the legendary reputation of themselves to stand. When somebody starts bragging on them and there's a big flowery uh, introduction and everything else, and then they, they accept all that praise, there's, there's something off there. You look at, uh, there was angels. The word angel in the Bible simply means messenger. We always think it's this blonde woman with uh, with big wings and that's an angel no every time we have a description of an angel in the bible they look like men and god sent angels and he sent messengers and many times the person to whom god sent that messenger falls down and they start worshiping that angel and the angel a messenger from god will say stand up i'm not god god is the only one worthy of worship god is the only one worthy uh, for us to bow down to. God said early on, he said, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And I don't want you making pictures or graven images or idols or statues of other gods. I don't want you bowing down to them. I don't want you praying to them. I don't want you worshiping them. Not in any way. He said, I am a jealous God. He said, that's not something I'm going to let slide. How do I know Jesus is the Son of God? After he was resurrected, that first Sunday, there was one of the disciples skipped church that day. He missed out. Boy, did he miss out. Jesus showed up to church that day, literally. And word got to, word got to, word got to old Thomas. And he said, I don't believe it. He said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and I can put my fingers in there and put my hand in in the side where he was wounded, where I saw that spear going to him. I'm not going to believe it. So the next Sunday, he made sure he didn't miss church. And there Jesus was again. And here's what Thomas did. He said flat out to Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. Jesus didn't correct him. Now, there's no in between. Either Jesus is God or he is a false prophet. 
because he allowed worship as though he were God. The wise men came and the Bible says they worshiped him as a child. They were worshiping him and he accepted and allowed that worship. And so if he, if he was not God, but a good, a good man, a good preacher, a good prophet, then he would have to say, get up, don't worship me. You look at the apostles, some of them, people started uh, uh, worshiping Paul, and they said, oh, he's, he's Mars, or he's Apollo, or somebody. And, they started, and he said, no, 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 I'm not a God. I'm here to tell you about the true God. Not here to present myself as a God. He, he, he disallowed that, rightfully so. That's one little area of discernment. Oh, there's so many times when we need discernment. So many times where, where we wonder, is this a right decision or should I go a different direction? That would be a good time to spend some time musing, studying closely, giving some deeper thought to the situation. Let's stand tonight. We'll close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for giving us instruction on our thought life. So little thought is given to our thought life. And yet, so much in our lives, everything in our lives is affected by our thoughts. Help us to learn, help us to study, help us to spend some time even musing about this. God, may these truths stay with us. When we face these situations, when we follow the biblical pattern and say, I'm, I'm going to muse on that. We pray that uh, you'll keep us safe throughout this week. Bless the Bible study on Wednesday and, and uh, speak to us and teach us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.